Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm Anthony Painter. I'm director of the RSA's Action and Research Centre and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today for this um, special um, event. And before we begin, uh, can I ask you to turn your mobile phones to silent? Uh, we are filming today uh, and live streaming over the web, so a very big welcome to those of you joining us online. Uh, and a reminder that the hashtag is RSA Anger. Sounds like our Monday morning meetings. So please do join the discussion on Twitter. Um, housekeeping stuff over. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our very special guest today, um, Pakaj uh, Mishra. Um, Pakaj is an award-winning author and essayist. Uh, he has nine books to his name, uh, and his literary and political essays appear regularly in the world's best periodicals, um, from the London Review of Books and the New Yorker to the Financial Times to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, foreign Policy and Prospect Magazines both named him in their top 100 global uh, thinkers lists and his incisive commentary and analysis have seen him win various prestigious awards for both fiction uh, and non-fiction. Um, his latest work, uh, The Age of Anger, has been hailed as prodigious, iconoclastic and bow-churning. Um, and it couldn't be more timely on an essential guide to this particular moment of alienation and dislocation. So please welcome me um, in welcoming Pankaj. So we're going to do it slightly differently today. Um, we're going to have a conversation for um, half an hour or so to expand on some of the ideas and explore their relationship to um, a variety of current global um, issues. And of course, I will open it to, to the audience. And we should have plenty of time for audience participation. So I'm going to start off with a few sort of basic questions about some of the concepts you raise in the book. Um, could you outline for us what the story of Resantamon is and why it's so important to your argument? Um, it's really crucial to the argument because um, it's, a, it's an emotion and really it's a, it's a sort of emotional history of the present. I should have, if, if, if the publishers weren't so dead against um, the word, I would have put it in the title. That's, it's an emotional history of the present. Um, people have described it as an intellectual history, but I'm really actually interested in emotions. Mm -hmm. And ressentiment is a, is a powerful emotion one that has been identified with the world we live in, with the modern world, right from, its, right from the inception of the modern world. So right from the 18th century onwards, as uh, we move away from uh, the authority of the church and the monarchy and start to devise societies for the new kind of human being to inhabit, the secular human being to inhabit, we, talk, we start talking about equality. Uh, Ressentiment is something that is innate in the nature of societies that are built upon the principle of equality, that promise equality to all its members. Um, at the same time, those societies are highly unequal. And there exists in those societies a kind of structural inequality that is almost impossible to eradicate. But at the same time, its highest, principles, its highest principle is equality. And ressentiment emerges in this collision, from this collision between ideal and reality. When large numbers of people are aspiring for equality, and increasingly in the last um, 30 years or so since the end of the Cold War, um, they have sought equality in a state of prosperity. Uh, that has been another kind of great ideal held up around the world. Um, and uh, I think a lot of ressentiment that emerges today uh, is of people who feel not only left behind economically um, of losing out on opportunity, of, uh, on, on, on opportunity for social mobility or, or suffering from uh, lower income uh, and seeing wealthy people flourish, but it's also a res resentment of people who they think have more political and cultural capital, who have managed to make their own preferences prevail and become uh, sort of dominant goals of that particular society. Then they have in mind, by the way, people like you and I, yes. um, who, and, some and some of our audience, who have monopolized unfairly uh, all kinds of uh, cultural and intellectual capital and have, yes. and have managed to basically make our own self-interest blend with collective welfare. 
So Risontum was kind of a, an angry yawp of resistance to, to change in which you don't feel you have a stake. Is that kind of broadly...? That is, that is broadly it. And I think the philosopher who first identified it, uh, who I talk about at great length in the book, is Rousseau. Yes. Um, right when the principles of the modern world were being formulated, uh, he said that this is really a problem. It's kind of opening up a huge source of discord within the human soul. Um, and that this new society that we are trying to build and entering very fast, this commercial society built around the ideas of self-interest and mimicry, yes. of, of mimicking people who are rich, wanting, craving their privileges, that this would create a permanent source of suffering inside people's soul. Interesting. Um, and this is then a critique which is again, you know, all through the 19th century expressed by a variety of people including yes. uh, Tocqueville and, and, and Kierkegaard and, 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 and Nietzsche of course has his own spin on this. Dostoevsky of course is the yes. greatest master of, of Ressentiment. Yes. He Indeed. understands it, it more clearly than anyone. So I was going to come on to Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau um, because you make an interesting contrast early on in the book with Voltaire and I think this is a contrast that was made by Nietzsche. Um, in, in effect, and I think you, you, you discuss this in, in the bibliog bibliographic essay at the end of the book. Um, but the, the comparison that's made is between Rousseau as the sort of plebeian outsider and Voltaire as the man of commercial society, worldly power, influence, high culture. And straight away we're into a, a sort of almost classical populist formulation of the, the elite versus, versus the outsider. Is this what attracted you to that contrast between those, those two figures? Very much so. I mean, I think I was um, really, uh, and I started thinking about this book uh, after um, Narendra Modi was elected prime minister in India in 2014. And he came, he emerged uh, in, in very much in the, in the way Trump did by scorning, by openly disdaining <coughs> the English-speaking metropolitan elite of India yes. and saying this elite does not care for us and us, the people, uh, the real people. And we need to essentially overthrow this elite. It's corrupt, it's self-serving, it's mendacious. Mm. And uh, it's really been eerie to watch the same rhetoric being uh, echoed by people here yes. in, 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 during the Brexit campaign and afterwards and also in the United States. So I think my initial uh, intuition uh, in 2014 that there is you know, a lot to be explored in this particular polarity that Nietzsche identified between Voltaire and Rousseau since we are living in a world where the older distinctions of left and right um, have ceased to matter, yes. liberal conservative has ceased to matter. Yes. And I think the biggest political oppositions that we see now really are between an elite that is seen, uh, correctly or not, uh, as having basically monopolized um, the, the, the best places for themselves and, and the best fruits for themselves, and the rest of the population which feels left behind and disdained. Yes, it's interesting. And, and I have to say that, you know, you, because we're an elite, you're involved in lots of conversations with elites, and obviously in a post-Brexit world that applies doubly because everyone's completely anxious about Brexit and Trump and all, all this. I mean, I was in a, a, a broad conversation three or four weeks ago um, with a variety of, of business thinking, journalist, you know, elite um, in effect. And what's surprising about the conversation is how quickly they defaulted to seeing democracy as a dangerous thing that had to be controlled institutions had to be controlled, um, even resorting to you know, the context of fake news, which is a, you know, a live debate and to censorship of some description. And what kind of left me kind of shocked in that conversation was that how quickly they went for the, the liberal and democratic institutions, which you'd expect liberal elites to be most offensive of. Yeah. No, I think, you know, I mean, post-1945, um, if you look at Europe, and uh, this, this Princeton scholar, uh, Jan Werner Muller, actually wrote brilliantly about this uh, in a book called Contesting Democracy. He, he pointed out that you know, most uh, post-1945 European constitutions or political systems were really informed by a fear of the masses because what had happened previously had uh, really turned into a cautionary tale for um, you know, these sort of post-war builders of Europe that we cannot 
entrust the masses with you know, the kind of political decisions they were making early on, which were catastrophic, um, you know, voting in demagogues or certainly giving them a lot of mass support. Um, so there has always been that fear of mass democracy. And you know, we know that all through the 19th century, it was actually suppressed. Yes. It was highly, highly limited. Uh, the rhetoric about liberal democracy always um, you know, avoids that uh, suppression. Yes. Um, but I think in, in, our, in our own time, we've kind of seen many contradictory tendencies. We've seen um, the weakening of sovereignty of, of nation states, um, a kind of virtual equality that digital technology has uh, enabled where people feel empowered to say anything to anyone um, in public on social media mm. which you know in a way um, it's a it's a poor substitute for the kind of equality that they actually want yes. um, and you know essentially they want an end to their own suffering their inner suffering yeah. but you know right now they're kind of just projecting it it outwards yeah. but democracy has always suffered those kinds of you know pathologies and, and, and that's a point I make repeatedly yes. in the book that we've idealized it far too much. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a kind of um, distracting rather than enriching form of equality effectively is the way. Okay. Now the, um, there are other figures in the book who are very important and one of them is Mikhail Bakunin. Do you want to just say something a bit about him and how important he is to your historical and current analysis? Yes, he's, a, he's been um, you know, kind of oddly neglected, forgotten figure. You know, in his own time, uh, he was hugely, hugely popular and an you know, international figure. And he was also, we've forgotten, he was one of Marx's uh, great competitors. Um, and both, of course, hated each other. Yes. Um, and Marx very clearly saw him you know, as a very strong rival. And, and correctly, because he held out um, this uh, very seductive idea of essentially changing the world through a few violent strokes, yes. um, and uh, which was very attractive to, to, to a lot of very frustrated young men at the time. And of course, it's in the late 19th century we, we, when we saw a kind of you know, truly massive explosion of terrorism. Yes. You know, the terrorism we have today really is relatively minor. Uh, heads of, the number of heads of state who were assassinated in that period, yes. uh, not to mention, you know, public bombings, bombings of cafes, um, yes. and, and in one case, parliament. Um, so that, a lot of that kind of violence was inspired by this sort of, these new theories, um, and some of which were articulated by Bakunin about you know, yeah. passion for destruction, that is a creative passion. Yes. Don't worry about what will come next. Uh, it's important to first destroy, um, and then we'll see what happens. So basically saying to Marx, look, all these fantasies of yours about having industrialization, building working class consciousness, having revolution, this is all taking far too long, and it's not gonna happen. Um, let's use violence creatively. And that is the idea, that is the source of uh, a very important strand in, in modern culture, which is terrorism yes. and terrorist violence. Yeah. And it's not just it will take too long, but actually you will you'll seize more freedom by doing it, by doing exactly. it this way, because you erect this enormous structure, Absolutely. which is further denial of, of freedom. And then the final concept I want to explore before opening out some of the, some, some of the themes in the book is this, this idea of anomie. Right. I've, I've always taken that to mean rootlessness. Um, it's sometimes translated as alienation. Um, and is the major error of modern liberal society this, that as you expand liberal culture, institutions, markets, you inevitably get more anomie? Is there a direct relationship between the well, two? Well, I've seen that very closely in India. Um, you know, it's large countries like India and China today where you can see a whole lot of insights of 19th century sociology, Anu being, being one of them, mm. being verified today. You know, modern sociology, as we know, grew out of the experience, a traumatic experience of 19th century Europe, uh, of mass society, urbanization, the application essentially of economic liberalism yes. to these societies. And we see now a, a more aggressive form of um, economic liberalism, which for want of a better word, we might call new liberalism, mm. which requires, uh, of course, you know, a whole lot of cheap labor, 
and, and, and so in India we see a massive movement from the villages to the metropolis, to the big cities or the, or the smaller cities, which are not equipped at all to accommodate um, millions of people traveling to them at, at many different levels, politically, socially. But they're also, I think, what, is, what we are witnessing is the short-circuiting of all the processes that make us human, yes. living with a family, belonging to a community. People are leaving homes very early on. You know, for instance, the, um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard about this horrific rape, rape incident in Delhi a few years ago, yes. uh, on which various films and documentaries have been made, much, uh, much discussed. Uh, the perpetrator, one of the perpetrators, uh, left his home at the age of seven mm. to come and work in Delhi and lived in a horrible, horrible slum. Um, so before he dehumanized and before he, he, he committed this really horrific atrocity, uh, he had been utterly brutalized um, mm. in the way he had led his life up to that point. Mm. Um, and this is the experience, I mean, this is an extreme version, this is the experience of a lot of urban uh, migrants, uh, rural, rural migrants, people who move to the big city and find themselves unsupported by any kind of family structure, social structure. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, their host, their host cities have no space for them, have no place for them. They're already overcrowded. I mean, as, as I'm listening to you to, to talking, I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting, you think about the conversations we've had about these more rooted institutions, including the family, that those um, who have resisted the changes that we have seen over many decades, if not centuries, have done so on the basis of, of, of tradition, as opposed to human need and value. Um, and maybe because of that, the, the liberal ear wasn't able to, to tune in. Um, and maybe that's a reflection on both sides of the debate, almost, that, there was, that they were talking at cross-purposes, where there might have been some common ground about rootedness. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, my feeling is that, uh, which may be you know, controversial and provocative, but liberalism, I think, or economic expansion of that kind, um, really succeeds when the country, uh, when a specific country is actually expanding militarily, politically. Mm -hmm. And so liberalism's noon was in the 19th century when England and followed by America were expanding and they had resources, territories to conquer, and they could then start to extend uh, some of the benefits of that expansion to people within their own society. Yeah. And we know that took a long time too. You know, it's not until after 1945 uh, with the establishment of the welfare state that those benefits really did start reaching, to, reaching out to you know, large numbers of people here. Yeah. So it really works best when you have this long, large world to conquer and to you know, exploit and have, have cheap labor there, its resources uh, available to you. The idea that you know, a country like India, which, is, uh, which suffered decades of imperialism and um, has been struggling to create an industrial base for itself, only to find that we've already entered the age of deindustrialization, yes. um, that you have all these people being educated in a particular way who are moving to the big cities yes. and finding there are no jobs for them. Um, so this particular idea, which worked for a tiny minority in the world, mm. Uh, to think that it can work for everyone else has been a foolish fantasy for a long time. Yes. And we are seeing the conse political consequences of that today. Yeah. Also because e economic uh, decline in large parts of the West has become inevitable with the, rise of, with the rise of China. So we are beginning to see the problems with this ideology right here. Yes, and we'll, we'll definitely come back to that. And I want to just pick up on this, this notion of global culture, markets, the anarchism of Bakunin, Anomi, all this comes together in a really intriguing story in your book about two figures. One is Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, and the other is Ramzi Ahmed Youssef, who was part of the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993, who interestingly, I discovered in the book, was uh, a maternal nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. So there's all sorts of links there. But the most fascinating thing is in, they come across each other in, in this Colorado penitentiary. And Youssef sees McVeigh as a, as a soulmate, um, almost. And you know, do you see them as the sort of heirs to um, in their own mind, to, to backing in and confronting Anami, and what does that connection tell us about modern global society? Well, I go back um, 
in the book, in that particular chapter, where I describe uh, McWay meeting Yusuf and bonding immediately. Um, and then I go back to the late 19th century when similar meetings happened in prisons, in cafes, in clubs, across Europe, across Asia, across Latin America. People from different backgrounds, Italians, Indians, I mean, this is a history we know very little of, uh, but it, you know, this shaped much of uh, culture and, and economy back in the late 19th century where um, immigrant labor in particular, um, and you know, that was the age of serious immigration. What we have today is really very, very small compared to what happened in the late 19th century. So it was out of these conditions of immigrant labor, uh, real kind of ill treatment of immigrant labor, uh, their discontentment, their ressentiment bubbling over, turning into acts of violence. Um, and I think, you know, in many ways, what we are witnessing uh, in the last, uh, what we have seen in the last three decades is a return of some of those pathologies of people traveling, moving. I mean, Ramzi Ahmed Yusuf is a classic instance of just a, someone who's been on the move all his life. You know, he spent time in Kuwait, he was in Wales, uh, doesn't belong to any particular country. There are lots of these people around now, you know, people with no clear affiliations. Now, McQuay, on the other hand, is sort of classic uh, American figure. But at the same time, he's also shaped by international forces. You know, he's talking back in 1992 about how the American dream is dying and nobody cares about it. Um, and politicians are fooling people. And it's a sort of chilling paragraph in one of his writings. Like, racism on the rise, you better believe it. Is this America venting its frustration? You better believe it. Um, so, you know, 26, 25 years before the advent of Donald Trump, he's predicting that there will be an eruption of racism, which would be essentially the frustration of, you know, a lot of people who feel they've been left behind, they've been given a bad deal. And his own act of violence was, you know, it's a you know, classic instance of propaganda by the deed. It's like, take notice of us, uh, what is happening to us. And Trump's now pulling up to drawbridge, uh, of course, in response to this globalized rootlessness, which you can only surmise will, will have a further echo and re re repercussion. Exactly. I mean, that's as violent and destructive as McQuay's act. You know, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the problem with, uh, with, with, with these kinds of reactions, is that the feeling of powerlessness, the feeling that your life is being controlled by opaque forces, that is real. A lot of people feel that today. But then the political response tends to be counterproductive. Um, it is simply you know, an expression of, 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 of vengeance and, and, and hatred and loathing, uh, which is also what Donald Trump represents. Yeah. And I, I think it's important that we talk about your, your perspective on ISIS um, in, in, in the book, because I think you almost see it as an aspect of anomie and asentiment um, rather than the no more usual in Western discourse anyway, description of ISIS as a sort of perversion of the Islamic faith. Is that, is that a fair contrast? Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, uh, I feel that we committed um, a huge mistake after 9-11 to locate, in trying to locate the roots of militant violence in Islam, or in, for that matter, in any particular religion. I have written literally hundreds of thousands of words about Hindu, uh, fanaticism, chauvinism, um, and I don't think there's a single sentence in any of my writings which tries to explain or understand um, any kind of sanction in Hindu scriptures for acts of violence by, by Hindus. It strikes me as really incredibly um, intellectually suicidal, given the long history of terrorism in the West, which has been committed by all kinds of people, uh, Christians, atheists, uh, I mean, you name it, any, any, any kind of uh, ethnicity, nationality, uh, you will find evidence of what we call terrorism there. And indeed, I mean, suicide bombing we know was pioneered by not Muslims, but Hindus, Sri Lankan Hindus. Uh, they were the ones to use it as a political tactic. So we got really seriously um, um, lost when we started to think about terrorism in the context of Islam and Islamic texts. And ISIS, uh, you know, has proved that to a large extent because at least people like Osama bin Laden had some elementary knowledge of Islam. Yes. So they could um, dress up their acts of violence with, you know, selective texts from here and there. And you can find texts, you can find texts for uh, sanctions for violence in the Bible. You can find, you can definitely find them in the Gita. Yeah. 
you could argue the whole text is a, is a, is a sanction for violence. Um, so that's what they were doing. And, and, and these folks uh, who join, young folks who join ISIS, uh, they barely read anything more sophisticated than Islam for dummies. Yeah. And sometimes not even that. Um, yes. So again, this, this sort of notion that it emerges from some you know, 7th, 8th century uh, text or 13th century debate is, does make for you know, a nice kind of um, intellectual fantasy. Yes but it's not really a rooted one. It's good for class of civilization style analysis. Very much and then so. this, this anomie and ressentiment, then, then you kind of see playing out, obviously, in what we've just seen happen um, in the US, perhaps what we've just seen happen in the UK with Brexit, maybe the sort of uh, rioters in 60s America or, or the 80s Britain or 2011 on the streets of London. You know, it's kind of the language of the unheard, as Martin Luther King would say. Does it tie all these things together? It does, and I think we are witnessing, we are kind of experiencing it um, and feeling slightly shocked mm -hmm. because um, a lot of these voices have not been heard. You know, a lot of experiences have disappeared from our literature, from our philosophy. You know, I was thinking the other day, the experience of the stranger, the experience of the provincial outsider, which is central to 19th century literature. You know, wherever you look, uh, that's where that figure, the figure who comes to the big city to make a fortune, gets humiliated, um, and then recoils into himself, and or goes back. Um, that experience is gone. The village, the province, that has all disappeared from imagination. Yet they exist. Mm. Those, it was people in rural areas who overwhelmingly backed Donald Trump. Yes. Um, so I think large aspects, large areas of the human experience has kind of gone missing. And I think what I wanted to do highlight with this book was that those experiences have made history. Yes. Um, and that we have been too invested in this fantasy of you know, progress, free markets, the, the, the Berlin Wall is down and now the world is converging on a single model and it's all, you know, hundreds of millions of people are being lifted out of poverty in India and China and, you know, uh, McDonald's is opening up all over the world. Uh, this was really a puerile fantasy. Yeah. And I think we are dis we're basically discovering that all of these emotions never went away yeah. and they have shaped history. I mean, you, you, you write towards the end of the book, you know, we, we, we need analytical techniques but our unit of analysis should also be the irreducible human being, her or his fears, desires, and resentments. Is that what the Enlightenment ended up getting wrong? It always sought to play the whole and the aggregates rather than the, the particulars. Um, but you know, I, I just wonder, reflecting on that, and I will come back to that point about the particular versus, versus the general, but I mean, you've mentioned it there yourself briefly, but one criticism of your book is that you do ignore quite a lot of real economic and social progress. There are some material, significant material gains uh, for people work moving from absolute poverty into middle class lives in places like, like China and India. There are healthcare gains, there are educational um, gains. So would your criticism of those responses be that they lack the granularity of the particular, the true understanding? That's right, that's right. And also, I mean, I think, you know, I did not uh, at all set out to write a history of progress, quite the contrary. Uh, I wanted to say that progress has always had its costs and great costs that we have suppressed um, at great detriment to our own understanding of the present. You know, one reason why we find ourselves so intellectually helpless at this point is because we have believed too much in a straightforward narrative of progress. You know, progress occurs uh, and you can see it, you know, manifested in the extension of rights to all kinds of people who didn't have them. Um, the civil rights movement was evidence of progress. The, the extension of voting rights to women in the last century was progress, uh, and indeed the extension of rights to gay, lesbian uh, community, that's progress. But none of these are irreversible, yes. and uh, they're all very much contingent. And I think we've, we've forgotten all that. Um, and, and my intention was to really focus on some of these costs of progress, also the fact that progress is not continuous, it's not uh, irreversible, and that uh, you know, it also continuously creates victims that are invisible to us. So, 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 you know, progress for me, social mobility for me, and it's been great, 20 years have been fantastic. Yes. You know, I, I came from a small town in India, um, managed to educate myself and, you know, have benefited as a result of a globalized reality. So yes. I'm actually, you know, in a way, a poster boy for globalization. 
but I can also see that it has, it has, it has had many victims. So I cannot generalize my own experience into yes. you know, a, a narrative of progress that works for everyone. So we, we, we become complacent about the contingent nature of the gains that, that, that we've, we, we, we've made. I wanted to sort of go into a bit of the sort of moment and, and a bit of the prognosis if, if, if we can. And you, you quote Henry James um, in, in the book um, uh, with this sort of metaphor of approaching a, a Niagara. And, and Henry James says that the tide that bore us along was all the while moving towards this grand Niagara, which of course is the, the First World War. Um, you then tell this story about this, this sort of small fry, Il Duce figure um, in, in um, Fiume, um, Annunzio. Um, and it suddenly strikes me that we've got some, suddenly on the world scene, a number of bigger sort of Il Duce style characters with you know, contempt for women, descriptions of carnage, hostility to outsiders. They're in power now. What's, what's the sort of prognosis for conflict and progress in, in this environment? Well, I think, I mean, I'm so um, fixated on the present um, that I can't really, I mean, trying to figure it out, um, that I can't think ahead at this point. But I think it's safe to say we've entered um, a really unpredictable era um, that, you know, especially just the last 10 days of uh, the Trump administration has shown what a volatile world we are living in. Um, anything can happen um, anytime. And this man can say anything, and I think do anything, um, it seems. And we've probably only seen uh, some of the most you know, mild um, uh, aspects of his performance um, mm. that it might get more extreme as, as time goes by. And this is, my, this is my biggest worry. I mean, this is why I think we need to really start thinking very radically about where we are today. Uh, you know, the future may take care of itself, but we really have to think about where we are today. A serial groper, a Twitter troll, has become the most powerful man in, in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it really, I mean, we, we have to. And that's become normalized. It has become you, normalized. The fact you say yeah. that actually yeah. isn't that shocking anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Six months ago, it would exactly. be shocking. Yeah. yeah, I mean, people are lining up, including you know the prime minister of this country, to to be seen as friendly to him, um, and uh, this will go on. Of course, you know it'll become it'll become normalised. And you know, you think about I think about my nine year old daughter. What kind of world is she inheriting mm -hmm. at this point? Um, she asked me about Donald Trump, and um, she obviously finds him utterly ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, there's a little, little sort of anti-Trump cult building up amongst schoolgirls of her of our generation. <laughs> um, but really, I wonder about you know, her early loss of innocence. Yes. Um, at the age of nine, I was not actually aware of, of um, the President of the United States or what he was like. Uh, that did not affect me. Yes. And now it affects all of us, every one of us. And that's the world we have brought into being. Yeah. And yet, I mean, liberalism, um, which is one of the targets I think you have, have in mind in this book, you know, for a worldview that lies in smithereens, it seems to be actually pretty resilient. You know, we're talking two centuries or more. When faced with challenge in the past, it's fine, found ways of adapting, whether it's the welfare state, as you've already mentioned, or more controversially, colonialism. It has always found a way of adapting. Will it not do so again? Well, I think we'll have to then re refer to this unfortunate history of liberalism, which is that it really only rehabilitated itself, rhetorically at least, after a destructive war, which leveled most of Europe. Um, and it's only in opposition to such monstrosities as Stalinism and Nazism that liberalism became respectable again. Mm -hmm. And even then, you know, mind you, I mean, what we had after 45 was social democracy. It was not pure liberalism. Everyone was against at that point to the idea of a society being run like a market. Mm -hmm. um, we, everyone was saying that this had led to calamity, yes. uh, that we cannot conceive of human society in this way. And therefore, you had social welfareism in, in Europe. And we had social welfareism in, in the post-colonial world. Um, everyone, Nehru, all of these people emerged out of the uh, experience of, of the depression and, 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 the, and the sort of resurgence of far-right movements across Europe, convinced that we cannot repeat those mistakes. Um, and we need to have a benevolent state that cares uh, for the weakest. Um, so I think, you know, in a way, liberalism has benefited, especially in the last 30 years, by the disappearance of, you know, many alternatives like 
social democracy and indeed the, the collapse of socialism. And I think you know, we need to rediscover some of those virtues. It's not so much that we need to rediscover liberalism, but actually a liberalism very much tempered by social democracy. Yes. An embedded liberalism, as Polanyi would, would say. And in, in, in the book, you, you point, as others have do, um, in, with increasing voice over the last few years, between this sort of incompatibility between egalitarian democracy um, and capitalism. But again, isn't the point about democracy and that it provides a pressure valve? We might not like a lot of what's in the new populism in its various forms, but it is um, somewhat a, a pressure valve. And you look at sort of you know, 1890s America and early 1900s America, there was a similar process of populism and populist discourse going on to which there were institutional responses. And I just wonder whether actually democracy always finds a way of muddling through because it has these pressure valves in a way that many other systems don't have. That's very true. That's very true. And I think, you know, I mean, in just in the last 10 days, we talked about the darkness that has descended with Trump, but there's also a silver lining here, which is that of the enormous uh, resistance that we've seen suddenly, you know, manifest itself in, in the States in the form of women's marches, which are absolutely amazing. Yes. Uh, the spontaneous protests at the, at the airports. We showed that, you know, there are different ways of thinking about democracy. Uh, there are different ways of thinking about politics as a form of expressing compassion, as a form of expressing solidarity. For people you don't know even, you know, uh, but you feel compelled to put your physical body, you put yourself on the line, not just send or you know, like something on Facebook or Twitter, but actually show up at the airport, show up at DC, show up in public squares. Um, so we may also be seeing at the same time a rebirth of participatory democracy not just democracy that is an affair of the elites um, you know, with their programs and policies um, which don't really involve um, a distracted electorate and population who are busy with their you know, telly and video games and the internet. But you know, for, for, for really the first time in my lifetime, I've seen in just the last 10 days an American public uh, respond to a calamity with a, a great deal of moral strength yes. and I think that is a promising sign. Yeah, absolutely. Now, final question for me. I mean, you, you end the book for me on a slightly discordant note. You know, having laid out for us this sort of corrosive dynamic of social, material, political change, cultural change, power and disempowerment, you, you finish by saying there is a need for some truly transformative thinking about both the self and the world. Where might this thinking come from and what might be its starting point? Well, I think um, most importantly, um, a feeling that the self is interdependent, that it is not autonomous. That's the biggest mistake liberalism makes, um, that we are all connected. It might sound very new agey, but it is a fact. Um, and I think we have to devise a politics and an economy that takes into account the interdependence of our existence. And that also involves recognizing that the self is divided that the self is prey to all kinds of conflicting impulses. And, and the next step is to actually feel compassion for that self and extend that compassion for other people. Um, and you know, it's been very disheartening to find these sort of divisions in Britain and, and, and in America between the Remainers or the, and the Leavers and people accusing each other of racism and, and, and bigotry. I think it's important to recognize that we're all bound together by suffering. Uh, that we're all suffering in, in, in different ways. And, and, and that is what I mean by interdependence and you know, uh, kind of truly transformative thinking. It's stop thinking of ourselves as individuals pursuing our self-interest independently of others. And somehow our self-interest will be harmonized miraculously and result in a common good. That's just nonsense, I think. So having said that was my final question, I'm going to take one more bite at it because Actually, what you, what you describe as a sort of social and divided self, and you know, in, we've often talked about 21st century enlightenment in this building, but that's partly about reflecting on our knowledge now about neuroscience and humanity um, is grounded in a notion of so, the social and divided self. So is your point that um, liberalism is just paying lip service to this? Because I think most modern liberals would, would argue precisely that. Well... It may be. I mean, you know, I'm not actually, uh, I haven't kept up with um, these new variations on, on, on liberalism, but I do know that the ideology that has been enforced and that's been embraced by large numbers of people, uh, not only here, but also in, in places like India or Indonesia, 
is that uh, the society of entrepreneurial individuals is the one that works. Mm -hmm. And that um, if only we were all be striving, well-educated enough to be striving for, you know, uh, particular uh, and, and, and very narrowly defined, materially defined self-interest, it will all work out for everyone. Uh, and the state needs to take a minimal role in all this. It needs to step back and, and cut back on its you know, welfare programs and that we are all actually on a level playing field. That's the other illusion. Um, and I think you know, if what I'm saying helps liberalism, I'm fine with that. I'm not stuck on labels. Um, I think you know, whatever works, uh, whatever makes us less unhappy, uh, whatever reduces our suffering, whatever reduces the possibility of phenomenon like Trump, yes. our Trumpism. Go with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to open it up to the audience. We're absolutely packed, so I know there's going to be loads of questions here. I'm going to take um, this young lady here, this lady here, and this gentleman at the front. Thanks. Thanks for an interesting talk. Um, so you mentioned about terrorism as an expression of frustration with the slow pace of change or progress or whatever. So do you think then that, so in a world where everyone expects instant gratification because of technology and everything else, then that terrorism is just going to become worse or more frequent? Or are you less pessimistic than that? Let's take them in banks of three. So then it was this lady here. Yeah. I don't know why I read the title of your book as The Rage of Anger. <laughs> You mentioned people like Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, Rousseau, and maybe I add Spinoza as well, had that ascetic strait in common between them. But they are not equal to, to ordinary person like me. They are gifted. And yet, I sense that they had that sense of resentment as ill will, is well, ill will that is expressed um, towards self, and it can be because of their gifts they projected on politics, society, etc., etc. One question I want to ask you is that um, inequality is is reality, and it is it is not. Um, does it not? Is it not important for mental and economic economical advancement? What do you think? Okay, thank you. No, it was this gentleman just at the front here. <clears throat> so, if you take the hypothesis that maybe some of the aspirations set out by Trump or some of the Brexit advocates doesn't come to pass because it's more difficult than they, they envisaged. I know you said you find difficult looking forward, but it, what does history tell us about how the populist movement responds when the dream isn't realised? And so they've been hoodwinked twice, not once. I mean, yeah, really good question. is there anything in history about that? I don't want to sound more bleak than I already am. <laughs> <laughs> Your personality is not bleak. Your analysis sometimes is. <laughs> but um, history doesn't offer too many reassuring instances of de-escalation. Um, you know, what we are seeing, unfortunately, is a pattern of escalation where people out of often very legitimate feelings of and very grounded feelings of frustration, impotence, vote for, make unvoice, uh, make, make, vote for um, uh, scoundrels and, and bigots and make extremely unwise political choices. But then those people are in charge. Uh, and we have seen this film numerable times. And then uh, the logic, the momentum of events, uh, they take over. So, you know, this is why it's sort of very difficult to predict what's going to happen next, uh, because we have a really strange bunch in, in power in, in the White House right now. Practically every day there's a, there's a news report today in the New York Times about uh, the ideological makeup of the people around Trump. And these are crazies. These are really crazies, um, and they have access to thermonuclear bombs. Uh, but I try not to think about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, that doesn't really help us at this point. Um, I think it's really 
trying to understand uh, how we've got there and, and, you know, and, and, and that to me seems crucial um, in understanding how to figure out how to get out of this. Um, because otherwise one would be paralyzed by fear and, 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 and simply would not be able to think very, very clearly and, and simply engage in sort of, you know, acts of survival which will just consume too much, too much energy. Um, the other question so the, was... This is a question about a sort of inequality of gift and, and talent and isn't it necessary for sort of mental and economic advancement? Well, I think, you know, that is, I mean, we, our systems have placed a huge premium on certain kinds of education, which is meant to empower you in the marketplace and, 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 and you know, equip you with the squil skills that you need to succeed and to, you know, get either get a good job or start a good business. Um, but I think what you're referring to is something that is not acquired through conventional education. I mean, a lot of these people were self-taught. Rousseau was self-taught. Um, someone like Gandhi, he did go to, you know, college and, 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 and he had a conventional education, but all of his education really came through reading randomly. I'm talking about inequality as reality. Um, inequality as reality, it's, I mean, that has always existed. And I think it's been, in a way, compounded in recent decades by the fact that cert the certain set of skills that you have if you're talking about education. No, I'm not. I'm talking about inequality. It's coming to term with reality. That equality, inequality is a, is a biological, it's a, it's a, it's a fact. Inequality is important. In, inequality is important. Yeah. Uh, as to, to what ends? To help us to advance mentally and economically. But what is the logic of that argument? This is what I'm confused the about. Achieve what? I mean, none of these figures, not, none of these figures were taught themselves in competition. None of these pe figures um, taught themselves in competition with anyone. None of them were thinking, none of the figures that you mentioned. If they had taught they were competing, in fact, what they were critiquing was the competitive spirit that causes spiritual, psychological disorientations deep within the psyche. And, and creates, can, sorry, can, can, I, can, can I finish? Um, what I'm trying to say is that these, these figures had identified competition as something that was deeply, deeply damaging to the human soul. That competition can be good if you're seeking certain goals, obviously, but plunging every human being who may not be equipped either temperamentally or by circumstances, by education, to compete is a pointless and counterproductive game. You know, I know people who don't want to compete, who don't want to work too hard. They, live in, they want to live in their village and tend their animals and tend their fields. They don't want to compete with anyone. Why should they be forced into this universal competition? There are many people like that around the world. So why do we force our ideas? If we want to compete, let's all compete in London. Why are we also bringing these people who are living who have been living their lives in different parts of the world. Why do we all want them to be like us? So if you think, if you think and it's, you know, uh, you're perfectly entitled to think that inequality is important, uh, but why should we turn that into a general principle that applies to the rest of the world? Okay, and then the, the, the next question was about instant gratification and its relationship with violence, even, even terrorism. Well, I mean, you know, obviously digital technology has uh, been a boon. In fact, you could argue that ISIS has used the internet and Facebook and social media generally more creatively um, than any counter extremist or any kind of government uh, initiative to counter ISIS. Um, so what used to happen in the late 19th century when people you know, needed to meet face to face uh, and often had to travel large distances, Geneva, I mean, a lot of these people often met each other and, and in, in order to hatch conspiracies. 
uh, that can be accomplished you know instantly these days um, so again I mean you know when we talk about the darker side of accelerated communications and globalization um, we are beginning to acknowledge that Facebook and Twitter which were upheld as emancipatory forces when they first arrived and people filled the squares of um, Cairo and, and, and Facebook and Twitter were credited for bringing down, quite falsely by the way, for bringing down uh, Mubarak. Uh, it turns out that these technologies are, are better deployed by all kinds of nasty people, including uh, various despots around the world. Okay, I'm going to take three questions inside the room, and if you make them quick questions, the rest of the room will get a bank of questions in afterwards. So we're going to go with this lady here, the gentleman right at the back, and a gentleman right down the front here. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the people who are happy to stay in their villages, because I still want somebody who will grow my crops, not intensively. I want somebody who can mend my shoes. I admire people who get satisfaction from making things. I think everybody should be able to make things with their hands, their eyes. I heard Richard Sennett in this room some years ago. He's got it exactly right. How do we value those? Do we all need a Finnish um, citizen's income? Switzerland rejected it. it how, we, we can't be equal. It's perfectly clear we can't be equal. And short of having a production run entirely by robots, which I don't think is very healthy. What do you then do with the surplus labor? How, how do we value people? How do we allow young people even to live off grid when they want, instead of telling them they've fallen foul of the planning regs? If we can make it even shorter than that, that would be great. It was a ge gentleman at the, at, at the back, or we go this guy um, first. Sorry, um, you mentioned linking ISIS terrorism to Islamic text is an intellectual fantasy by many Western policymakers and in the media. Do you think they are ignorant, or are they deliberately doing this for political reasons? Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm intrigued by the issue here of nation and belonging to something. Uh, are we not simply unraveling the drawing of lines and borders across the world, which frankly never made any sense when they were done, primarily by the British, I have to admit, um, because if you take Modi, it's very much more of a Hindu nation than anything else that's trying to be withdrawn. In America, they're just trying to go back to where they were 200 years ago, where there was white supremacy over everybody else. One contradiction, in all, I mean, even in Scotland, they're trying okay. to identify nation states. So it's about nations and unraveling many hundreds of years of incorrect history, if you like. Okay. Surplus labor, Islam and the media, and the unraveling of borders. Unraveling borders. Let's start with the last one. Um, I think, you know, in many ways, the uh, nationalist backlash that we see today, or attempts to recreate national communities, homogenous communities, you know, um, white Americans, or indeed uh, the English people, uh, free of people from Poland and, and, and indeed mm -hmm. elsewhere, uh, they are a response to the reality that the nation state the, this, this particular political unit, the main political unit of the last 200 years, has seen its sovereignty being eroded, that uh, too many transnational forces have put pressure on it, um, making you know, its democratic institutions look weak and unrepresentative. So this idea in its kind of, this backlash um, in, its, in, 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 a, in a very perverted form reflects a reality which is that the nation state is in trouble and the political community around which the nation state was originally created, there are some people who are trying to recreate it and saying we can go back, it is possible to go back, uh, we can make America great again, what that essentially means, we can make America white again. Um, and I think, you know, in a way, the erasing of borders um, has, has, has become a source of problem. It's entangled the human individual. And in the end, one has to keep thinking of the human individual, uh, the living and breathing human being, um, in all kinds of processes uh, which are opaque, which are invisible, which are unintelligible. You know, I mean, I grew up in a, in a country in India 
which was a coherent entity. We knew what was happening in our politics, who was taking what decisions. We even had economic plans after every five years. Uh, there was five-year planning. So we knew there were targets, there were goals. Uh, this sort of situation where you know, uh, capital is moving across borders, um, creating you know, prosperity on one side, uncertainty, other jobs flowing from one place to another. People, you know, when I was growing up, there were only two or three jobs available. And you, if you had them, you had them for like 40 years for the rest of your life. And people who came after you, your sons and daughters, could aspire to the same kind of life. None of those certainties exist. And they've all disappeared with the fading of the nation state. So in many cases, what we are you know, seeing is a, it's a nostalgic um, harking back to these older certainties. Um, and they take these perverted forms of, of racism and, and, and exclusionism, essentially. Um, this linkage of um, Islam, ISIS, and the media's role in that. Yes, I mean, I think uh, I would not credit um, the people who came up with this Islam terrorist link with dishonesty, because I think that would be, that would be crediting them with intelligence. Um, I think it's, it was really um, an ideological reflex, because post-89 particularly, there had been an enormous investment in the notion of the free world being morally superior to not just communism, but to every other thing, every other political alternative that existed. And the idea that some people might resist it um, was just intolerable. And the only way in which you could explain it by saying, there must be, I mean, this is, this is an exact quote from Francis Fukuyama, that there must be something in Islam that is resistant to modernity. This idea that modernity was inevitable it was desirable, um, and that you know, it should be embraced by everyone, uh, that was a very, very strong ideological faith. And when these folks, and they had been challenging it from I Iranian revolution onwards, 9-11 uh, was just a sort of extreme manifestation of you know, this long-standing um, uh, and, and long-simmering long backlash uh, to modernity. But there was, uh, I think, you know, very little recognition at, of the fact at the time that this kind of terrorism and this kind of violent reaction to modernity that uproots, that humiliates, um, has a long history within the modern West, and that, which has nothing at all to do with Islam. Um, so it was, really, it was really a kind of ideological delusion, and, and part of many deep delusions of the time. So this point about I, um, technologically driven surplus labour, what's our response? Well, I'm, I'm really terrible at figuring out how to. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, but it's a, you know, I think your question, um, actually, in a way, it's one of those questions that kind of open up possibilities about thinking and thinking further about how the good life is conceived differently and diversely across the world. You know, some people might find it in, in, in competition. Some people might find it in lack of competition. Uh, some people might find it in a mix of the two. And the same person might, might go through different spectrums in the course of a single lifetime. Uh, and how to make an economy responsive to those impulses, that is a huge challenge. That is a big challenge. And I think what we've seen really uh, is what um, Albert Hirschman called monoeconomics, mono he coined the term, which basically referred to the assumption that the rest of the world should follow one particular model of development, and you know, which basically involves allotting particular roles to everyone in a, in, a, in a given society and saying, this is what you have to do. This notion that you're offering um, of, you know, people being able to follow, or people being able to find dignity, satisfaction, creative satisfaction in their work, uh, that has become increasingly difficult because what we've been forced into, and, and I see this at very close quarters in India, we've been forced into an economy where you're supposed to specialize, you're supposed to do certain things, and old skills, old crafts, old um, practices have had to be discarded, they've had to be abandoned. 
And so this is what you know, I've been consistently writing about, is this kind of homogenizing discourse, which insists that one way is best, our way is best, and just rides roughshod over any kind of uh, diversity, and just some, simply fails to acknowledge that human beings are differently constituted. They're not necessarily unequal, but they just have different goals in, in, in mind. OK, I'm going to make myself very unpopular, um, but I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Um, other than read the book, what's your final thought that you want the people in the audience and indeed online to take away from today? Well, I think, again, I would stress, I mean, at this time of anger and, you know, the evidence for which just is pouring out of um, the newspapers every day and news media every day, um, I would say, again, you know, at the, at, at, at the risk of sounding uh, new agey, I think we do have to think about the virtues of compassion and the virtues of solidarity. These are words that have disappeared from our vocabulary yes. Yes. Um, from the, in the last 20, 30 years. You know, there's been far too much talk about competition, advancement, improvement, um, you know, this, this, this impoverished language of self-aggrandizement has got to stop. Uh, we have to think about um, other ways of relating to the world, other ways of relating to our own selves. I think that's a very resonant final thought. Um, I've read the book. Um, I recall having an enormous degree of excitement when I first read Tocqueville, Dostoevsky, Durkheim, Nietzsche. I was a strange young man. Um, <laughs> but you'll get the same sort of excitement when you read um, this book. I'd highly recommend it. But for today, thank you very much and brilliant and welcome thank to you. Us.